Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode number 37. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the coaches, athletes, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank everyone who has liked, shared, and commented. Your support allows us to continue to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals in the strength game, just like our guests today. I also want to thank our sponsor, Cerberus Strength, owned and operated by active lifters. Cerberus is trusted by the top strength sport athletes and lifters in the world. Cerberus's wide range of products are made by athletes for athletes, truly living up to its moniker, made by the strong for the strong. From sandbags, training gear and supplements to lifting straps, knee sleeves and more, Cerberus Strength provides the highest quality strength products on the market, designed and manufactured to help you defeat, destroy and devour your competition. If you're in the market for the highest quality strength conditioning gear and equipment, be sure to use promo code STRENGTH underscore GAME at checkout to receive 10% off your next order at CerberusStrength.com. And in this week's episode, I am joined by Abby Goldberg. Goldberg is an assistant strength conditioning coach at Temple University, where she oversees training for the Owls field hockey, track and field, women's cross country, and spirit squad teams. Prior to her current role, she has also served as an assistant sports performance coach at Georgetown University and St. Stephen St. Agnes Upper School in Washington, D.C. Goldberg got her start in the profession after her undergrad interning at her alma mater, the University of Maryland, before joining the department as a part-time strength coach. Abby is very active in training outside of her college teams. She competes both in multiple strength sports currently competing in powerlifting through USA Powerlifting, and is also a strong woman competitor. I'm excited to have her on the show today. So with all that said, let's get in the game with Abby Goldberg. What's going on, everybody? I'm excited today. I am joined by, of course, another fellow, Iron Hoya. Uh, a little different different gap between our time spent at Georgetown and now kind of down with a bunch of my friends over in the Philly area at Temple. Abby Goldberg, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I know we kind of talked about it before we got rolling. Uh, for those that don't know, Philly is full of potholes. So, yep. <laughs> so you got the car in the shop, Cur so you can spare a little bit of time. It. Yeah, currently dealing with the tire situation today. Only uh, only the second time in a couple months, unfortunately. Yeah, you always got to be got ready in day. Philly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you could spare a little bit of time for us today, which is awesome. So I want to get right into it, kind of how you got involved in the strength game, what kind of sports you played growing up, and then eventually now competing in strong women and powerlifting. So can you kind of go through that with us? Yeah, absolutely. So I think my background story is a little bit different than I feel like most people. I think most people usually come in from like an athletic background where they're playing sports and, and they are lifting to help with that sport and kind of end up falling in love with lifting. Uh, for me, uh, unfortunately, I was not very athletic growing up. Um, I was kind of the worst of, of my friends at all sports um, and pretty bad with like hand and eye coordination. Uh, so I kind of just got to the point in like high school where I figured you know, if, I, if I'm not going to be very good at sports, then I probably should pick up something else just to stay active. Um, and I ended up just like choosing one year, I think it was like my sophomore year, I was like, all right, I'm just gonna work out five days a week for a month straight. Um, and I ended up, you know, being really consistent with that and kind of just like falling in love with uh, what it was like to work really hard consistently and see improvements. So, you know, it was, it was nothing exciting back then. I maybe had like 10 pound dumbbells or something ridiculous and like online workout videos, but like the difference that I felt and, and how I performed, that was like the first time I realized if I put time into something, I could get better at something athletically. So kind of the first time I almost felt good at something. Um, and from then I just, I kind of became obsessed with with working out, with training. Um, back then I was in high school and I had access to like the apartment complex gym, which had like a, 
like a curl bar and that was all. So I would load up like plates on there and like as much as I could uh, and, and like look up any sort of, of new training that I could. I was kind of obsessed with like podcasts and blogs and all of that. Um, and I ended up uh, doing that for a while before I even really touched a real barbell. Um, kind of the obsession started then. Uh, and then when I went to college, that was the first time I really had access to a real weight room. Um, and, you know, back then I'm, uh, it's crazy to say it now because I'm obviously so comfortable in a weight room. It feels like home to me, but back then it took me, I think a couple of months to, to build up the courage to walk into the college weight room and, and train there. Uh, but I remember when I finally did go in there, it was the first time I did like a barbell back squat, and a deadlift. Um, and I was so excited to do these movements. Like I had been following people on the internet. I found all these cool ladies who were lifting super heavy. And like, I somehow knew, even though I hadn't really done that, that that was, I wanted to be that person. Um, and I just remember that day so clearly. I think that must have been for me, the moment when I really fell in love with like the, the strength aspect of training, um, I just remember walking out of that weight room feeling like so strong and so powerful. Um, it sounds kind of cheesy, but it was it was life changing to me, really. Um, and then from there, I I in college ended up doing some personal training. Um, that's kind of how I started on the professional side of things. Like I think a lot of people probably did. So I started working at a gold's gym, uh, in Crofton. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that area. Um, and like, you know, I had access to a bunch more strength training equipment. Um, and I actually made friends, you know, as you do, I made friends with the people in there, the women in there who are also into training heavy. Um, and I made friends, um, with this awesome, girl named Jess and her and her partner uh, trained out of Coliseum as well, uh, the gym in Columbia, uh, the strongman gym and, and the, the strength gym in Columbia. And she was like, hey, you're really strong. Um, you know, there's this, this strongman thing they do on Saturdays. There's a strongman Saturday where you pay $10 and you can like play with all the equipment. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, so I went up with her like impromptu one, uh, one Saturday and ended up having like an amazing time there. Um, John Ward, uh, who's in, in charge of all that strongman stuff was like, so awesome to me and all the guys there. Um, even one who you had on the podcast before Greg, uh, I always remember him as the cat guy. He was amazing to me there as well. And the ladies there as well. Um, just like so welcoming, like that really was my first experience with, with strongman and strong women stuff. And it was such a positive it almost felt like a family experience um I was really really drawn to that environment because of that um and it, it's funny because I actually ended up even though I think of myself sometimes more as a power lifter I actually ended up doing a strongman competition first um I think like a month or two after I did my first strongman Saturday um there was like uh a competition at Coliseum it was like Beast of the East or something and I was like oh I'll just sign up for it and do it um, and I did it and just had such an amazing time. It was so much fun. I mean, I just love everything about Strongman, the environment, the bruises, the scrapes, all of it. It feels so like gritty um, and, and awesome, <laughs> like for lack of a better term. Um, and then, you know, after that, I, I very quickly ended up doing a, a powerlifting competition that year as well. It was another like push pull at Coliseum, um, which was also super fun. And, you know, I love I do think of myself, like I said, more as a power lifter, at least in how I train, especially. Um, and it's, it's just a, it is a slightly different environment when you go to a competition, a powerlifting competition uh, versus a strongman competition. Um, it's interesting, but like basically for the past couple of years or about two to three years after that, I was pretty consistently um, doing like one strongman, one powerlifting competition a year and just having a lot of fun kind of going back and forth between those two sports. Um, in my opinion, they kind of support each other really well too. You know, all of my powerlifting work is going to support my strongman work. Um, so yeah, that was, that's the, the main story of how I got into like the strength sports. I think the past couple of years, I haven't been as consistent with like competing in a, as much as I'd like to be. I'm still definitely training. Um, just kind of between, uh, career development and COVID obviously and injuries and setbacks. Um, you know, I can make any excuse for it. It is what it is. I need to get back in that game. But it, uh, the plan is is to get myself going this year at some point as well, because obviously I, I think maybe you can tell I really I really love being a part of those competitions. No, no doubt. That's pretty evident. That's cool, though, <laughs> to hear everything from the Coliseum aspect and mm -hmm. kind of 
like even going to Gold's Gym and getting started, but I can imagine it was probably pretty intimidating. I don't, I don't remember how many undergrad or at Maryland, but to go into one of those gyms or even the varsity gym, like eventually when you started working there and interning, um, that's probably pretty intimidating to go in there with as many people in there for your first time and like going from an apartment gym with 10 pound dumbbells or whatever is left kind of scrapped over from someone that vacated an apartment. So that's, that's a big change of pace. And then to go like, yeah, John Ward's awesome. Like everybody at Coliseum, I hope my uh, old pit shark's doing well over there, (laughs) but yeah, those, those guys and getting involved in like the strongman Saturdays and just the environment, like you said, is awesome. And the power lifters are on the other side and like all the bodybuilders are on the other side too. And it's almost like kind of honeycombed into like different sections. So you can always kind of cross over and talk to everybody and kind of see what's going on. And people always come out to support the others for competitions. And it's, it's definitely an easy transition to either be supportive, train or or compete or kind of dabble in each of them. And, and you said pretty well too, like powerlifting and strong women, like they definitely complement each other. So it's cool, but it's definitely difficult to try to be involved in both of them. And I'm sure that the competitive side of it for anybody that hasn't done a strongman competition or done a powerlifting competition, they're very different setups. So I know <laughs> that it's a different approach you have to take different preparation. And I'm, I'm sure that suits you really well working with all the different variety of teams that you have currently in your role. So kind of touching on after you got through personal training and everything, what, what kind of led you to the collegiate side of it and getting involved? Like I know you got involved at your undergrad at Maryland and then kind of worked your way up to get to your position at Temple. Now, what kind of sparked your interest to get out of personal training and then get to the collegiate side? Yeah, well, I kind of feel I was trying to stay directed on that conversation about how I got into strength sports, but truly it kind of meshes with the timing of how I got into strength and conditioning. Um, I feel like those those two things really go together for me, as they probably do for most people. Um, But when I initially went to college, I didn't even really uh, go in with the mindset that I was going to, you know, be a strength coach or a personal trainer, even Uh, even though I was really passionate about that, I kind of just had the mentality that I was going to, you know, choose a safe career path that would, you know, provide for me and and take care of me financially. So I originally um, went to school for nursing, (laughs) uh, which is really funny. I couldn't imagine myself being a nurse, but it it seemed like a good move at the time. Um, And after about a year of school and undergrad, um, you know, I love my teachers. I love the the classmates I had and I did well in school, but it just felt like I was really, really passionate about lifting and training. um, And I really wanted to see how I could make a life for myself doing that. Um, So I ended up, uh, I actually initially went to school at uh, UMBC, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And then I ended up transferring to College Park uh, to pursue kinesiology. Um, And that's, you know, that was kind of the turning point where I decided like I wanted to be involved in some way in training or coaching. Um, And I was doing my personal training then. And I think about the summer before my senior year of college, I decided, you know, if I was going to try and pursue strength and conditioning specifically, I needed to get some experience. So I actually started up uh, interning at a, at a private facility in Gambrels, Maryland called API. Um, And I did a summer internship there. um, And I was really fortunate at the end of that, uh, they had a open part-time position um, that I was offered and and happily accepted. So, you know, when I graduated college, I was doing that part-time and I was still personal training. And then it was kind of another turning point where I figured, you know, if I, if I want to make collegiate strength and conditioning an option, then I need a collegiate internship as well. Um, So that's, it's actually after I graduated from the university of Maryland, I decided I would just go right back over there in the fall um, and take on an internship there, which, honestly turned out to be probably one of the best decisions I made in my career path. Um, One, because of the incredible mentors and support I had there and everything I learned, Um, but also just, uh, it was fortunate timing. Um, I was about a couple months into that internship when they um, opened up a new position that they hadn't had before. Uh, It was basically like a professional internship or a part-time position is what they called it. Um, And they offered me that position and I was able to you know, spend the rest of the year there working part-time in addition to what else I was doing and actually like 
you know, really, I think it's incredible in your first year of a college internship to have the opportunity to like coach your own teams, uh, obviously with the support from the, from the coaches there, but like, that was such a valuable opportunity for me to have so young um, in my career and, and to, to take that with me and to learn so much. So after that, I was basically looking for the, the next step. You know, I was, you know, I had some part-time experience. I needed kind of a step that would bridge the gap between where I was then um, and, and getting into a full-time position. Um, so I ended up going to Georgetown, um, which is where the Iron Hoyas alum comes from. Uh, Coach Hoffman, who you've had on the podcast before at Maryland, he was really wonderful connecting me um, with the coaches at Georgetown and kind of helping to facilitate that relationship. Um, and then I, I ended up getting a position there um, they have a really uh, cool program, which I know you're familiar with, where you basically work at Georgetown for the first half of the day, um, and then you go to a high school in the afternoon. Um, so not only did I have, you know, all the amazing experience and support from the coaches at Georgetown and the ability to train teams there, I also ended up at what I think now looking back turned out to be the absolute best high school I could have ended up with, which is um, St. Stephen's and St. Agnes Upper School. Um, and coach Carl Johnson, uh, who is the strength coach there, is an absolutely amazing mentor to me. I could not speak higher of him. Um, he did so much for me and, and put so much faith and confidence in me. And, you know, he's someone who is also an Iron Hoya, um, but he's been in the business uh, so much longer than me. And from the second I started, you know, working with him at the high school, you know, he treated me as an absolute equal, which is, you know, I, it's, it's hard to describe how someone could be so kind and so humble, but I had, you know, such an amazing experience between working with him and working at Georgetown, um, also doing the CSCCA internship during that time. I think of the Georgetown year in my mind as probably one of the most difficult years of my life. Um, Cause in addition to all of that, I had about an hour long commute to and from, which I'm sure many strength coaches have done before and probably worse than that. But um, I, I know it was probably one of the most important years um, in my career as well, because it set up so much, so much important growth for me. So after that, uh, the year was coming to an end and I was looking for a job applying to, you know, any place in the area I could find um, and a position at Temple opened up. Um, and once again, uh, Coach Hill at Georgetown has a great connection with Coach Teefee. Uh, Coach Teefee is also another Iron Hoya. You can see how everything connects, all goes back to Georgetown. Um, and, you know, he put in a very good word for me, Coach Hill did, uh, and I ended up getting the position at Temple. Um, and so I, in July, I will have been at Temple for two years now, which is kind of crazy. It, it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but I mean, once again, Temple has been such an amazing place for me to grow. I, I've said it like a bunch of times, but I feel like every place I go, I have uh, so many amazing mentors and I can say the same, you know, whether they're above me or on the same level, coworkers, bosses, like the, the coaches at Temple are so amazing. Um, and they honestly truly feel like family to me. I know that I can count on those guys for anything if I need it. Like I said today, I had a car issue and it was no problem. The guys said, take care of it. We got it covered. So um, I, I feel very lucky that my career path has been, has gone the way it has gone. And, you know, I know a lot of it is, is the work and the effort and the passion that I put into it. But I also know that a lot of me getting where I am is, is due to the people who believed in me even more than I believed in myself at the time. I feel, I feel really grateful to all of those people. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's definitely great to have people in your corner that are, that believe in you just as much as you do. And sometimes when you don't, and that's the mark of a good coach and a mentor, someone that's going to help you kind of along the path. And you took like a, I don't, there's no traditional path in strength conditioning, but you took one like almost a stepping stone approach. Like most people sometimes kind of bounce around. Honestly, you finish a GA and then you go back to an internship or you get a full-time job and you're like, oh, I'll go back and get my GA because I can't get the next level job. You kind of had the perfect trajectory, I would say, like inexperience wise, where you went from intern to part-time to coaching assistant to full-time. So when you kind of look back on that from your transition, were there any sort of like big lessons that you kind of learned along the way or kind of prepared you for each kind of next step in that? Because I mean, you had, like we said, we had, you had some great mentors, some of my, 
my all time favorites, Carl Hill, Trevor Hoffman, <laughs> like you had a lot of people helping you along the way, but they kind of help you to the next stage. And then it's up to you to kind of fall within that role and then really own it. So what between each like stage and different job kind of really helped solidify that one, you want to be in the career for a longer duration and that you were ready for more roles and responsibilities. Right. That's a great question. You know, I think, like you said, it was a stepping stone path. Every single job I had after the next um, increased in responsibility that I had. So it's not like I was ever drowning at any point. Everything kind of led to the next thing. Um, I think I probably, you know, maybe struggled the most with learning how to build um, really clear and open relationships with sports coaches. I think that's really like I found that every position I had, I felt always felt comfortable coaching athletes, coaching teams. Um, you know, there was some development there, of course, but uh, the biggest stepping stone for me was kind of that the next level to the job is like what's behind the coaching, what's behind the programming, the other details that you need to do on the side, the communication, um, the, I don't want to say negotiating, but the, um, I probably couldn't think of a good way to say it. the the compromising and, with coaches and then working through um, working through conversations in that way. Uh, that was probably the biggest part. And then you know, learning some of the background stuff too, like you know, the social media work that we do, or you know, the general facility maintenance that we do beyond just like being an intern and cleaning stuff up. Um, all of those things. Uh, those are probably the biggest learning curves for me, honestly. And you know, I can say kind of going back to like the sport coach communication and relationship building, which I think is, is probably a part of the job we don't, I mean, we do talk about it, but I think from an outward perspective, you wouldn't really realize what a big part of the job that is. I, like you said, always had mentors who were really good at supporting me and learning that process. Um, especially, you know, at Georgetown, I had the ability to have more of those meetings with coaches um, and those conversations. And I could always go back, especially like Coach Terry, um, who's in charge of the CSCCA internship program was when I was there, I could always go back and talk through something with him if I needed help with something. And even in my full-time role at Temple, like I know any of any of my coworkers, Coach T, um, or, or my boss or Coach Tifi, Coach Whitney there, if I need something, if I need to talk through a situation, they've always got my back with it. Um, so they, you know, they've always given me anywhere I've gone, they've given me the freedom to kind of learn and, and to independently grow in those relationships. But I also have always felt like if I need something, if I need someone to have my back and kind of walk me through something, they were always there and happy to do that. Um, no, that's good. And you need, you definitely need some time to actually figure out things for your own, but it's great to have like almost a fail safe. And when you're first starting off in your career, you kind of have that safety net where someone's supervising you. They're kind of overlooking your program. Um, they're asking like prodding questions to make sure that you're actually thinking about everything that goes into it. Cause most people think like general people that would look at a program. It's like, it's just putting exercises on a piece of paper, but <laughs> there's a lot of more intangibles and things that go into it. Like I'd like to think of it as strength and conditioning and dot, 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 there's a ton of things that come behind it, whether, like you said, communication with the coaches, like, does it reflect what's actually in the season, what they want to see, this unique player? There's, there's just so many confounding variables that go into it that when you're first starting out, like, those are the questions mentors ask. And then as you make your way through your career, like, full onus becomes on you when it's your program. Like, you'll right. still have mentors and your boss and everything kind of check up but it's it's going to be a lot more infrequent than it was before because you should have those intangibles kind of built in place now and then you can kind of learn and figure out all the like nooks and crannies of communicating with coaches kind of figuring out like your style how you want to like communicate with the players and actually like control the room there's a lot of stuff like that that people just kind of brush aside as it's just what's ever on the whiteboard. This is what we're doing. Get in and get out. But that's, that's definitely not the mark of a good strength coach for sure. So when you kind of look at it, um, kind of being 
in this field and profession in collegiate sports, I don't know the exact numbers, but I can tell from just being at work or seeing other people at the conference and stuff, it is a very male dominated profession. And for whatever reason, but it's starting to slowly kind of, you'll see more females getting into it, breaking into like internship roles and then becoming full-time coaches and then even like sought out for certain positions and things like that. Were there any kind of like struggles or roadblocks when you first started, like being a female in this profession or anything that you felt like kind of held you back or things that maybe we can work to improve on to be either more welcoming for more female coaches to enter the profession now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it is, you know, and you're asking me personally, I think it's important for me to note, like, this is my personal experience. Everyone, you know, has a different experience. What I might experience is, is different than another woman in the industry. I feel really lucky um, with all the support I always had going into strength conditioning. Um, there was no major point where I ever felt like an athlete or a coach um, or anyone was, was coming at me or, or was rude to me because I was a woman. Uh, don't get me wrong. There are some athletes who were rude, uh, but I think that had less to do with me being a woman and a little bit more to do with them and their personality. Um, and uh, so like, I, I feel very fortunate um, that I didn't have any major roadblocks in that way. Uh, there is definitely like this feeling and I've noticed it more as I'm in the industry longer. And I know, you know, I, I am a young strength coach, so that's probably part of it too. Uh, but sometimes feeling like as a woman in the industry, you're right, there's not a huge amount of us. And a lot of times places will seek out a woman because, you know, they're looking for that diversity, um, which is important, but it can start to feel like, you know, oh, you're, you're at this position only because you're a woman or you're just, you know, that we had to get one on staff. I make the joke. I joke about it because it, it is funny too to, to joke around about, you know, there's got to be at least one. Um, and, you know, on one hand, I appreciate that people are seeking out diversity because I think it's important that the athletes see people, a variety of people with a variety of experiences um, and that different athletes are able to see coaches and look up to coaches that maybe they recognize or, or look like them or they're familiar with. Um, but sometimes uh, I think the view is almost that some women only get their job because they're a woman. Um, and it can start to kind of feel like it takes away from, from all the effort and all the passion and all the things you did um, to work up to that. And, you know, I'm sure there are situations where, you know, people get jobs undeservingly, but I mean, my personal belief is that happens across the board, men or women, it happens across different industries. Uh, there's always going to be situations like that. I just, I don't find that, I don't believe that the majority of women in this industry are in any position that they don't deserve to be in. Um, and, you know, that's obviously probably my bias as a woman, uh, but, you know, th that's probably the main thing, but that's not really something that anyone ever says to me. It's just, you know, the feeling that you get sometimes. So it might be something that I personally need to overcome a little bit too. Um, but I, I think that's the main thing, just validating uh, the women who are in the profession and, and respecting what they've done and, and making it clear that, you know, you know that they've earned their position where they are. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and I actually was kind of thinking about like the topic of how do we get more women in the field? Because I know a lot of places will be looking for female strength coaches and it's not always that, um, you know, they want to hire a female strength coach, but they don't always have, you know, candidates who are applying or qualified candidates. And um, I can speak, I think I can speak for most of female strength coaches when I say that we want to be hired because we're qualified for it, not just because we're women. Um, and I think a bigger thing that we can work on is maybe getting more women in the field in general. Um, and I definitely don't have like a, a solution to that, but like a perfect solution. But I kind of was thinking, and I was talking with my coworkers about this a little bit too. I think the way like most people end up getting into strength and conditioning is usually they're a young athlete um, and they're in a weight room setting, whether it's like high school or college where they're being mentored by a strength coach. Um, and, and they become really passionate about that thing and have you know, that extra support to pursue that interest. So I kind of feel like we could almost start with like the mentorship approach with the athletes that we work with, you know, are you, are you supporting all the athletes in there? Are you, are you talking to your female athletes and, and cultivating interest in strength and conditioning, not pushing it upon them, but if you see someone who's, you know, interested in, in this and, and wants to learn more, like uh, how can we 
better cultivate that interest as well and, and talk about it with them and support them. And, you know, like I said, I don't think I have a perfect solution to that. And, and that doesn't just necessarily mean that I, as a female strength coach, need to talk to those women. I think like male strength coaches can absolutely help cultivate that interest as well um, and be amazing mentors. But, you know, that's just kind of me going off on a rant, trying to figure out ways that we can get more women in the business. <laughs> um, but yeah. No, I think that's a great point. And um, I think that's a great place to start too, because you do get a lot of athletes that kind of are uncertain about what they want to do when they get into college and maybe they're taking whatever that general studies or haven't been undecided major for two years and they're really trying to figure it out. And, and I, I know I've had two this year, like on my lacrosse team that were kind of in that boat. And one of them actually got, is doing a master's and going to do that at Denver now. And then another one is like a born leader. And she was always doing her own uh, things at the end of program. And she'd always drag people with her. And like, I'd always encourage them because it'd be cool to see them. Even if they don't do the college side, they become their own camp counselor or start their own private clinic or whatever it ends up being like they're a coach is honestly just another mentor. So if they're a strong female voice that can actually mentor male, female, whatever athletes that are coming up or anybody in any profession, then I think that's a win, but it's definitely a good place to start because if you, if you see someone that has like a real interest in coaching that there's a definite way to like advance in it. And unfortunately a lot of female sports, and even there's some male sports like Olympic sports and everything. There's a huge gap between being done with college and then professional. There might not have any professional sports or the gap between there and Olympics. Like if you're a mediocre shot putter, there's nowhere really else to go. And unless you're in the Olympics and then there's not very many professional softball teams. So your chances of really playing at a high level after are kind of diminished, but if you want to still stay involved in athletics and like be involved in sport and things like that, most people thought it was just sport coaching, but strength coaching is definitely another viable option. So I think that's a great way to kind of tailor and talk to some of the athletes and see gauge if there's any interest in it. But so kind of when you touch about it, like I know in your personal career, there hasn't been any like glaring issues like on the female side. Do you think it's partly also because you kind of practice what you preach? You're, you're lifting, you're doing your own competitive stuff. You're involved in training still. Like, is that kind of easier to bridge the gap doing your own lifting with the athletes that you think maybe wouldn't have come there if you were just a coach and just living? Only. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that probably goes for male and female coaches. Um, like, you know, if, if you're practicing what you preach, the, the athlete's going to buy into what you're doing a lot more. I will say in a very amusing way, I do enjoy sometimes uh, being able to lift a lot more than the majority of the male athletes I work with. Um, not to, you know, not to make them feel bad, but just to kind of keep them in check. And that's by no fault of their own. If they're working on their sport, they might not be necessarily as strong as someone who is pretty competitive in, the, in these strength sports. Um, even if there is some uh, biological differences in, in what I can do, but I think that, you know, it helps kind of helps keep some perspective for them. Uh, but even, you know, I'm not by any means, I'm not like insanely strong. I think I'm pretty strong for the most part, but even if I was a little weaker, I think uh, just the fact that I, I train hard and I work hard um, and I'm constantly trying to get better and trying to get stronger. I think, I mean, it's a big thing at Temple um, that we, we push and support and I have, a lot of support there um, from when I started working there that we need to practice what we preach and we need to do what we're telling the athletes to do. Um, and how can we expect them to get in there and be consistent and work hard if we're not going to be doing those things. So, I mean, I think it's probably the same, you know, for a woman as it is maybe for a male strength coach who doesn't necessarily look the part of a strength coach, whether they be like maybe a little bit smaller, a little bit skinnier, I think still the most important thing, once you get past the appearance of someone is, 
you know, what are they doing? Do you see your strength coach getting in there during the extra hours and lifting and working out and training? And can you see them demonstrate the movements that you need to be doing in that lift, uh, you know, properly? And I think all of those things, uh, regardless of who you are, really plays into, into how much your athletes, um, how much your athletes respect you, honestly, and, and will listen to, to what you're telling them. Yeah, I think it definitely builds respect too. And I mean, strength is going to be relative for the person and how you look and things like that. It's, it is relative. People play different sports. There's different body types. Like strength coaches are going to look different ways because they're involved in different things or they train a certain way. And honestly, I'm probably not going to look the same right now that I am when I'm 60. So <laughs> It, it is what it is like as we, long can as hope. You, uh, <laughs> we can hope but I don't know we'll see we'll see what happens but at least you're being able to relate to the athletes and I think they definitely buy in a lot more when they see that you're going through the similar process if, if you're at a different part training age wise you're a different piece on the scale you're training for a different thing as long as you're constantly improving like whether it be coaching whether it be training anything we're trying to get smarter at something else like those are the things they see and as, as long as there's progress involved and that you're going through something difficult and you're not just dictating difficult things to them i think that's what really carries over with them and that builds the respect for sure what uh from your coaching like what kind of lessons have you been able to take away that maybe help with your own training and then kind of vice versa like from your own training obviously you're training in two different sports like we said, competing and strong woman and powerlifting, like the powerlifting back room is completely different than a strongman competition where sometimes like, especially at Coliseum, you're just scattered out on the grass. <laughs> maybe, maybe an event is inside. Maybe an event is in the back. Maybe an event is in the front so they can put some more holes in the concrete parking lot. But <laughs> your stuff just scattered across the place. People have tents. They're very different. So the mindset going into those lifts is different. The training day is different, like all those sorts of things. So how has kind of like your coaching helped your own personal training? And then vice versa, like we said, how does your training kind of help steer your coaching or learn techniques or cues or things like that? I think that's a really uh, cool thing to think about. Um, so when I think about like how has my experience as a strength coach helped with my personal training and competing, I think the biggest thing is probably the perspective that it's given me with like the process um, and the setbacks and, you know, the injuries and the good times. Because when I work with an athlete, it's a lot easier when I'm training them to see the overall picture and, and they might not be happy with where they are at the moment, but I can see how much progress they've made. I can see where they're growing, where they're developing um, and, and where they're improving, I can see the big picture for them. Um, and it kind of helps if I can apply that thought process to myself. Um, I think when I first got into my own computing and training, I just wanted to get as good as possible, as quick as possible. And I wanted every single session to lift a heavier weight and to be infinitely stronger. Um, and, and obviously, eventually, I ran into some setbacks, I think, as everybody does. I ran into some injuries. I ran into life. Um, and I had to, at a certain point, uh, kind of take a step back and look at the whole picture of my training and what I was, you know, truly doing it for and, and what does progress look like and how progress can come in different ways um, and can look different ways. Um, so, I mean, that, that's helped me personally, because um, I think maybe the first time I ever got injured in my training, it was like devastating to me, the idea that I wouldn't be able to train heavy for whatever amount of time it was. And you know, now if I deal with a setback, the, the reaction is so different. Um, even though I still love training and I want to be as strong as possible, my reaction is almost so much calmer. I'm like, well, you know, we've, we've done this before. These things happen. We're going to, we know the steps to work our way back and we're going to work our way to where we need to be in a smart way. So um, it's definitely given me a lot of perspective for my own training. Um, in terms of how my training, I think, helps me coach is just, I mean, like it, me training, it fuels my passion, not just as a strength coach, as a career path, but like the, the part of it that just loves it to do it, to train on my own um, and to, to compete and, and all that I get out of that, the, the hard work, the competitiveness, uh, the desire to be better, all of those things. 
it kind of helps me remember, like, that's how I feel about lifting. That's how I feel about powerlifting and strongman. For a lot of the athletes, the way I feel about lifting is the way they feel about their sport. So it kind of just helps me with the approach that I have with them. Um, and, and it reminds me that I need to help them understand how training is going to make them better at their sport. I mean, I think that's a goal for any strength coach and connecting with an athlete, but truly, you know, if this is the thing they are so passionate about and they love, and if they want to get as good as possible in that sport, the way I want to get as good as possible, um, in powerlifting and, and in strong women, um, then I can, I can understand that passion and I can help them connect the dots between what I do with them, uh, to being the best possible athlete. Um, so that's honestly the biggest way it's connected to me. That's awesome. Yeah. I think sharing that experience and, and being able to go through it yourself is definitely beneficial because you can come at them and have conversations. Like you said, they have a setback an injury or they're just, they can't see the forest for the trees and they, they don't understand the big picture. They're so focused on hitting a certain number or scoring this many goals or whatever it is. And they just, they're at a roadblock being able to kind of like share that you've been this through this before, like you said, progress kind of shows itself in, in different ways and that they're due for a breakthrough or like maybe need to back it off. So you don't have a bigger setback. I definitely, those are cool things. And I like what you said, talking about like how you feel about lifting is the same as the same passion that our student athletes feel about their sport. So kind of with that in mind, how do you make sure that I know this is a big thing for young coaches when they first start out. I, I would fell victim to this as well. How do you make sure for your student athletes that you don't make your passion like lifting become their passion? Because honestly, we know that we get a lot of athletes that don't want to be in the weight room, don't see the importance of it. Maybe it takes a while for them to actually click for whatever reason, but they really just see it as a means to an end. How do you make sure that you keep their priority and like passion involved in their sport and not drift it towards yours and lifting? Right. That's a great question. As much as I'd like to make all the student athletes I work with train super competitive powerlifting, that would be a lot of fun for me. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> sounds great. I mean, I fulfilled that when I had some powerlifting personal training clients who've done it before. Uh, that's, a, that's a good thing to think about. I think. I had to understand a little bit that the amount of volume kind of on just more practical level that I spend doing certain movements is not going to be what they necessarily need. Um, you know, I, I can still help them do the exercises that I love, of course, and do the things that I'm so excited about, but just kind of taking the time to really look at where are they at? What's their training age? Like, where are they realistically at and what do they actually need to get better at something? It's a lot less than what I need at this point in my strength training to get better at it. So, you know, I, I do believe all the things or a lot of the things that I do in my own training are so beneficial to them and making them a great athlete. I think that just goes with science. So it makes my job easy because I get to squat them and I love squats. So it's wonderful. It goes hand in hand. Um, but it's just about like knowing that those things can be in the program and they can be prioritized, but we need to balance them with, with all the extra and additional work that's going to make them excellent at their sport and it's going to keep them healthy. And I think one way that I've kind of um, done better at this is me personally taking on a little bit of that more athletic training um, and, and learning how to train a little bit more like that. Uh, and honestly, like when I train, you know, I train mostly for powerlifting, mostly for strong women. But when I started in my training, incorporating more lateral movements and, and more additional work, and even like some athletic movements like sprint and change of direction work, not in huge amounts necessarily, but, you know, in small amounts, it actually made me a healthier person and it made me healthier for the sport that I do. So I think the learning that and, and trying to train like an athlete yourself. I know a lot of coaches will say you need to do the things that you're asking your athletes to do. Um, it gives you some perspective on, on the importance of including, you know, additional work in there and, and gearing specific work to training multidimensionally and to training for that specific sport. Um, but I will always say like, you know, the basics, the basics done well are, are never going to be beaten by anything. And those are always going to be the most valuable things that the athlete can take away. So even if, uh, even if we're not, you know, doing the, the 
two to three times a week squatting that maybe would make my dreams come true. And we're only squatting once or twice a week and we're doing, you know, some other work. I'm still, I'm still happy to know that I'm supporting my athlete and giving them what they need, not, you know, taking away from what they're doing. Cause I never want to, you know, like I said before, this is their passion. This is what they love. I never want to get to the point where I'm so obsessed with what I love to do that I start to pull away from what they love to do. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think it has to be separate. I think we can, you know, we can achieve those both, those two things at the same time. Um, I truly believe that. Yeah, I completely agree. It definitely is a balance and it's, it's something you kind of have to balance your own ego and maybe your love for the barbell and dial it back a little bit for the athletes. And a big thing you said too, like volume is definitely one of the things that we kind of have to really kind of play, put a big emphasis into the program, because like you said, they're, they're practicing their sport all the time. And it's very different for us practicing our sport where it's, it's strong women. It's, it's powerlifting. Like it is the barbell. It is these certain events so that's where a lot of our volume comes from. And you said too, like their training age is vastly different from us too. So, and I think you can kind of start seeing it. It's cool to see you add in more bits and pieces from their program. And it does make you a more well-rounded athlete, power lifter, strong woman too. And I've seen those same kind of results. And I think you can see it too on the professional level for like pro strongman and powerlifting now there's not so many high level, like pot belly fat power <laughs> lifters that are breaking records. They right. look, they look jacked. They look like they could probably out sprint most people on any day. Strong men are now like doing a lot more conditioning and carry events and things like that. And it's not so static. And it's a testament to putting more athletic movements into both of those. And I think that definitely helps anybody that wants to be involved with one of those sports and you said too it comes in small doses but it's enough for you to get a taste and a feel for what your athletes are doing and and still kind of keep you grounded and connected because i i guarantee if you go out and run like eight 50 yard shuttles and then you go squat it's going to feel a lot different than if you spent 20 minutes warming up putting your briefs on putting your knee wraps on to squat and that's what your athletes are doing so right. it definitely keeps me in check when I, when I start programming for them, cause I don't want to stand out in the heat and like the Fresno heat for five hours and play baseball and then come lift. And, <laughs> and that's what those guys are doing. So I, I definitely got to dial it back. So uh, you've been at a lot of stops like so far in your career, kind of in that little triangle, even though uh, it's got its own fun commute involved for a lot of them. <laughs> So how has your kind of your coaching evolved over these experiences? Like we said, a lot of, we share a lot of mentors in common and those are a lot of great people that you've been able to learn from and pick things from. How do you think your coaching has kind of evolved from these different places and maybe what are some of the biggest lessons that you've took away from these stops or from being under the bar so often? Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things um, that I picked up just more on the, the programming side of things is kind of just um, the longer I've done it and the more coaches I've watched and the more people I've talked to, the more I have kind of gravitated to a simple approach. Um, and, and I'm excited to learn things all the time and I always want to try things, but you know, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. It, it feels like the basic things done really well uh, work really well. Um, and I, that's not revolutionary. I know I didn't come up with that saying, but you know, the more like the coaches that I look up to the most, they do the basics really well. Um, and, and they emphasize those movements and focus on that. Um, and, and that has kind of become more my mentality, uh, the longer I do it. Um, and kind of from like a, a coaching, like the personal perspective, uh, I've learned a lot about how to coach um, and command presence, like in a room, which is, you know, what everyone needs to learn when they're transitioning from if you're doing personal training, or even if you're doing like private sector work, one-on-one um, -on -one work, there comes a point where you need to learn how to transition your style from the, the presence you would have working in a small group versus the presence you have with a huge team. Um, and, and really a lot of that, it just has to do with how I hold myself, 
how I carry myself, the confidence I have in myself, um, and the way I talk to the athletes, the expectations I set for them and, and being able to keep those expectations and, and hold true to them. Um, that lets the athlete know that, you know, I'm in charge and, and this is happening. Not that, you know, I like to have a good, I like to have um, a comfortable relationship with athletes. Like I love to joke with athletes. I love to have fun. Like I love my job. So I enjoy that, but that can never be um, at the sacrifice of having presence and command over the room. That always has to come first. Um, and I kind of remind myself that I remind myself of the importance of that over, you know, the fun and, and the fun joking, because the presence is what's going to allow me to ask them to do things that are uncomfortable. And that's what's going to allow me to push them to be the best athlete they are and, and benefit them. So, you know, I'm very person, individual focused, and I want the best for them. So kind of learning how to connect the dots on that and connect the dots on being a firm coach um, and how being firm and how being clear and how commanding the room is going to actually benefit those individuals the most and help them the most. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned over, over my different experiences. No, those are great. Those are great points to have. I think people young in their career too, same thing, like coaching dynamics of coaching a small, a small group, coaching like an injured athlete, coaching a different sport, but even different sports at different schools, I'm sure like you've seen it yourself, like the difference between Maryland, Georgetown and Temple, like the type of athletes you get or however that's head sport coaches, like their standards and expectations for those team, those athletes carry it out. So there's very slight twinges and, and kind of cues that you have to put that fit into how you talk to them or how you kind of ask them to do, like you said, uncomfortable things. And that kind of becomes the art of the coaching side of it, where you're able to kind of seamlessly see exactly what they need, provide it, and then build a rapport so that you can ask them to do things that are difficult, but still develop a relationship with them that's not just demeaning and demonstrative all the time. Because at the end of the day, you would, you would hope that you could be able to have a conversation with the athletes and that the weight room is a place that they want to be in. And if you're constantly berating them or making them do things that they want to do and they don't understand why you're doing it or you just they feel like you don't understand them personally or understand their sport or things like that, then you're going to get a lot more pushback from them. And both sides, yourself as a coach and them as a student athlete are going to suffer. So, no, those are great points. The coaching presence is, is huge and being able to command a room is very important. And um, I can't remember 10 years back, like when I started, but I know for sure that it was a lot more timid and a lot more <laughs> nervous of like getting taken over by, right. by men's lacrosse team. I was like, all right, these guys. Just always men's lacrosse. Oh yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's hard when you're coming off a championship win or there's high expectations and that's, that's the standard all the time. And to come in and, just fake it till you make it and, and be like, guys, this is what we're doing. Um, it's definitely advanced. I, I'd like to say I'm not the same as I was then, but it's very intimidating. Like you said, when you walked into that first weight room, it's intimidating to walk into a coaching environment, walk into a collegiate weight room and have a team of 10, 30, 60 people in front of you and be like, who are you? What are we doing? So it, it's good to see that you have so many mentors and be in so many different places that you can kind of develop your own thing now and develop your own coaching style and, and command of the room. So now that you've been in a place for two years, you have all the ability to kind of lean on the people around you and, um, and still reach out to those other ones and, or even go visit some of the ones in the area. But what are some of the other ways you kind of do to sharpen the sword and like work on continuing education, either like strong woman powerlifting side, like who do you lean on or the coaching side and strength conditioning? Like what are some of the resources you look towards or the people you kind of look towards to develop more? Yeah. So, I mean, when I first uh, was really developing myself as a strength coach and as a power lifter um, and in strong woman, I think I was very into like the reading and the podcasts and blogs. And I still love all of those things and books, obviously. All of those are great resources where you can learn a lot, like obviously. I. But 
I think the thing that I've gotten the most from over the years is kind of what you were saying, which is the ability to be at those different places and learn from coaches and talk to them. And when I was interning at Maryland, um, part of their internship program was visiting three different universities. Um, and that was actually like, I think that was the first time I really learned how valuable it was to be able to go to a university, to meet with a coach coaches there to watch them to coach and train and ask them questions and honestly that's the biggest way um, that I've learned stuff and taken on new stuff um, is to see that to see what you know makes sense to me maybe to learn some things that wouldn't quite make sense for me um, and to to start to integrate that into the way I coach and the way I train Um, and that can go for strongman and powerlifting when you go to a new strongman gym or a new powerlifting gym and you interact with a new athlete Um, or a new coach there, uh, you know, that's my favorite way to learn stuff. Um, You know, obviously I can go to a conference and and watch a seminar or or a presentation and learn a lot. But then the part that I feel like I get the most out of is when I can, you know, discuss that with someone else and have a conversation with a coach. So, you know, that is right now my favorite way to learn. And I, I, like I said, I'm really lucky at Temple right now, all of the people that I work with, I feel like if I want to discuss a topic or if I have questions um, and want to talk through an idea that they're always there with, with more knowledge than me and resources and ideas or, you know, different knowledge, at least things that I wouldn't have thought about um, and that, you know, we're going to be able to talk through that and I can learn some new stuff from them. So like, honestly, that's my favorite way to do it right now. Like I've leaned on all the guys who mentored me at Maryland were amazing um, you know, they're all the guys at Georgetown, men and women at Georgetown who mentored me were incredible. I feel like I could lean on any coach that I've ever worked with. Um, but especially like right now in my current situation, I feel like I can, uh, you know, they're obviously they're either in the office that I'm in or an office way. And, you know, the second I, you know, want to talk about something, they're there and we can, you know, go back and forth and talk shop and figure something out together. That's like, that's my favorite way to, to learn stuff. And plus they are, you know, they might be learning and reading something or listening to something that I hadn't thought to and they're talking about it and they're bringing it up. And then I'm like, Oh, I guess I should, you know, look into that. I hadn't heard that before. So I feel lucky to be surrounded by people who are, are interested in getting better and and I can always rely on them to, to talk through things with. Right on. Yeah. And it's, it's probably, I know the temple staff pretty well too. So I know exactly what you're doing. They're doing the same thing. So it's even cooler when you go visit somewhere and they go visit somewhere. And now you can kind of bounce ideas off of each other and share different topics and points of view. So it, it only kind of brings, rises everybody. I mean, the rising tide raises all ships. So if you guys are always looking to improve, looking to visit places, go talk to other people or bring your former mentors in, to have conversations with the rest of the staff, like everybody's going to benefit from it. And that's, that's the cool part about it. That's, I mean, those are my favorite things to do. It's kind of why I started the show was COVID kind of cut my ability to go travel and visit places right. like I normally would. And uh, the commute from Fresno to any other school is a little bit farther than uh, Georgetown to American or Georgetown right. to Maryland, where you can throw a rock and hit it. So this has been, this has been my go-to and, and, but visiting places, traveling with teams and having conversations with coaches in person. Those are, those are definitely the best things. Like I want to go right to the source. I mean, reading, like you said, podcasts and stuff are great, but at the end of the day, I'd rather sit down and have a beer with a coach for an hour than sit down and try to fumble my way through a book for 10 days. (laughs) Hey, so like any good training session, we end this off with a good finisher. So we got four quarters, four questions, and uh, overtime for you today. So you could take as long as you need, or we can go rapid fire with them. But you ready? Yep, ready. All right. Biggest influence in strength and conditioning, and biggest influence in strength sports, either strongman or powerlifting, whatever you want. I feel like I already cheated and answered part of this before. Um, I'll probably go out with the cop-out answer for strength and conditioning, which is all of the people who have mentored me before, uh, Maryland, uh, Georgetown, of course, Temple. I will give a big shout out, especially to the guys who initially kind of took me in at Maryland. Um, Coach Hoffman, who you've had on the podcast before, Coach Rhodes, Coach Franco, um, Coach um, – 
Hartford, uh, like all of those guys, not a lot of them aren't there anymore, but they're all uh, people who just, you know, really took me in and grew me as a coach and, and believed in me a lot. And I feel like I could count on any of them with any question I have at any time. Um, influence in strongman and powerlifting. I mean, I don't, I mean, I love like all elite FTS stuff. When I was getting really big into powerlifting stuff, I would always go to that. Um, I think if I could just go with like a hero in powerlifting, I would call uh, Jen Thompson like uh, ideal. She's like in her forties, so incredibly strong. I wish I could be her. So hopefully that's my road um, (laughs) when I get to that point. Uh, But yeah, I'll have to go with that. Nice. What can you be found doing when you're not coaching or competing? What are some of the go-to hobbies for you or in the Philly area? Right. Um, I like to bake um, and cook. So I'm honestly, I'm very much into food. I love food very much. That's probably my second passion, Uh, mostly eating it. But when I bake it really well, then I can eat it as well. So that's a benefit there. Um, if you ask, I would just like to say it probably should be on my resume. If you ask any of the places uh, that I've worked at before, they will verify that I have the best chocolate chip cookies. So, um, anyone is feel free to, to check in at those spots. They will confirm that I guarantee it. Um, and then also like, uh, I had mentioned to you before we started recording, I got a dog back, uh, last October who I'm obsessed with. So I love spending time with him and taking him to the dog park. Um, and, uh, and you know just being outdoors with him. There you go. If you weren't involved in strength conditioning and coaching, what do you think you would be doing? And if you couldn't do strong women or powerlifting, what sport do you, would you want to go professional in? I mean, the, what would I do is such a hard question for me, honestly, because I mean, uh, you heard it at the beginning. I was originally following a different career path and I'm just, I love training. I love lifting. So that's kind of where my heart is. I think I would still, you know, on some level want to be um, involved with working with, with younger people and helping them grow and develop. Um, Cause that's what I've become really passionate about. I just don't exactly know what that would look like. Um, so Hopefully, if I ever run into that road, I'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, and then, gosh, I mean, if I weren't a powerlifter or a strong woman, I think I kind of wish if I could go back in time that I had maybe gotten involved and tried um, some other sports. I kind of think like if I had tried something like track and field um, that was really like a little bit simpler and involved a little bit less hand eye hand and eye coordination, um, that could have been something that I really enjoyed. I, I feel like it has some similarities to like powerlifting in a way. Um, and, and that's something that I wish I'd kind of tried out when I was younger. I mean, who knows? I work with, with track athletes right now. Maybe I'll let them take me through a workout at some point and then I can, uh, then I can change my mind on that. I think you'd enjoy it. And I figured you would have said <laughs> Baker after that first. Baker. Yeah. Oh, that I want to be a Baker. Own your own bakery. Ah. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I think I want to enjoy baking. If uh, maybe if I was like a millionaire and I wouldn't have to worry about any financial stress, I would just, you know, open up a bakery and and do that. (laughs) Not too bad. So uh, if you're setting up your ideal training day, I know lifting might be a little bit different for strong women versus powerlifting, but what's your go-to music or training PR song? And then what's uh, your post training meal look like? So uh, people are probably going to make fun of me when it comes to music. Um, It might be like borderline uh, psychopath, but I'm actually fine to lift to silence. (laughs) Um, uh, If I have, I know it sounds kind of funny, especially if I'm doing like a one RM, I feel like there's enough going on in my head that I just want to focus and do that movement. Um, But if I'm like casually listening to music in the gym, I will always fall back on any like nineties, two thousands, hip hop and R and B. Um, I couldn't go wrong with that. And then post-training meal is always going to be simple. We're just going to go bacon, cheeseburger, fries. If I'm feeling crazy, there's a shake involved. That's usually a post uh, meat or post uh, competition meal, but never fails me. Is there a Philly spot that that is the perfect bacon, cheeseburger, fry combo? You know what? I'm ashamed to say that I have not explored nearly enough food in Philly. Um, COVID kind of messed that up a little bit for me too, but I'm going to have to correct that issue this summer because there's a few places that I've been have been 
Like there's some good food in Philly. And I, as someone who just said they love food, I need to go out there and find it all. Yeah. You got to get on that. So the last one I got for you for overtime, most valuable piece of advice you've received. And if you want to share from who. That's a tough one. I think, I don't know if I had one specific person um, say it in a specific way, but I feel like every coach that I've worked with has had the same um, advice about work-life balance, which is probably something we talk about all the time, work-life balance, but um, just learning how to, like, honestly, in our career path, that balance might not always be there. There's going to be certain points where work is overtaking life. um, And I think that's just part of it. That shouldn't always be like that, but, and that's part of strength and conditioning. That's part of a lot of careers, honestly. Um, But learning that even if that's the case, when I'm not at work um, and when I'm doing things outside of work to be fully present in that moment, because um, I think more than anything, the mental energy that I spend stressing about things when I'm outside of work, thinking about work, that takes away more than almost um, work itself. So being able to be fully present when I'm away and enjoy that. And then when I am at work, I'm able to be fully present and the best, the best coach possible for the athletes. That's great advice. I think that, yeah, you're not going to really get a balance 50, 50, and it's definitely not going to happen all the time. You hope maybe it kind of counters itself out throughout the seasons. As we know, kind of sometimes summer lays itself to be a little bit low key, but then, 12 14 hour whatever travel days during season are definitely going to catch up so it's more of a juggling act than everything but being able to kind of shut down put your phone away and like not worry about work for a while and kind of be present is definitely big that's awesome hey so for anybody that has any other questions want to pick your brain a little bit more or kind of follow you and uh maybe reach out for any cookies um how can (laughs) how can they get a hold of you or or follow you uh, yeah, absolutely. So I am on Instagram as Strength Coach Abby, and I spell Abby A B I. Uh, and then you can reach out to me through email at abby.goldberg at temple.edu. Uh, and that's that's pretty much it for my contact info. I'll keep it simple. Easy enough. Hey, well, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. I know uh, car troubles in the beginning, and uh, <laughs> this is summer time off. So I appreciate you coming on and uh, and chatting with us today. So it's it's good to have another Iron Horn on for sure. Absolutely. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Of course. Take care, Abby. Take care. That's it for this episode of The Strength Game. Thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors, Cerberus Strength. Be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below. Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachO'Brien.com, where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.